Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the CRISPR-Cas9 system. Okay, so we're currently in the process of discussing how the CRISPR-Cas9 system uh, can be used to create genetic knockouts. Okay, right. So, uh, we've just discussed the homologous recombination mechanism for repair, okay, uh, which is this way of repairing double-strand breaks, where you go to either the sister chromatid or the uh, homologous chromosome and uh, use that to reproduce the sequence of nucleotides that you have lost from the middle here. Okay, and that's the reason it's called homologous recombination, because really you are replacing the lost gap here with a sequence of nucleotides from another chromosome. Okay, so that's recombination because you're putting in a new sequence of nucleotides there from a different chromosome. Okay, it's homologous recombination because the sequence is homologous or the same, basically. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, we are now want to talk about how, uh, what, this, what did this all have to do with trying to do our genetic knockout. So, let's go back to where we were with the genetic knockout story. Okay, so, we had our chromosome here. And I'm just going to show one chromosome, but it's going to be the same for the homologous chromosome. Okay, here is a flanking portion. Then this portion in red was our gene here. Okay, and here is the other flanking portion here. Okay, right. We have now used CRISPR-Cas9 system to produce a double strand break there and a double strand break there. So what we now have is a situation like so. Okay, uh, we have the two purple frag, well, the purple portion here. Okay, we then have a little purple portion here. Okay, we then have our gene A in red here. Okay, and then we have this blue portion here. Okay, right. Now, what is the cell going to do? How is it going to repair that? Well, the way we want the cell to repair this is we want it to join this blue strand to this purple strand. However, God only knows what the cell is going to do to deal with this. It might try and use homologous recombination with the other chromosome, presuming that hasn't yet been cut by our CRISPR, okay? And it might end up replacing the whole of gene A. Most likely, it will just try and do non-homologous end joining and it will just start joining ends at random, basically, which we don't want either. What we want is specifically, we want this blue portion here to join to this pink portion here. So we are going to make use of homologous recombination. We're going to abuse homologous recombination to try and get what we want, basically, which is we want this blue strand to join to this purple strand, okay, without putting this portion here, which contains gene A, back in, basically. Okay, right. So, how are we going to do that? Well, this is how we're going to do that. We are going to create a DNA fragment, a double-stranded DNA fragment, which contains this blue portion here, okay, the portion upstream of the gene, okay, and also this purple portion, the portion downstream of the gene, okay. So, here is the blue portion, the portion upstream of the gene, and here is the purple portion, the portion downstream of the gene. Okay? And we are going to expose our embryonic stem cells, which have already been exposed to the CRISPR RNA. We're also going to expose them to this piece of double-stranded DNA. Now, why is this a good idea to do? Well, now, the cell is going to use this double-stranded piece of DNA for the homologous recombination repair. Okay, so let me explain how. So let's put some orientations on these fragments here. So this is a free prime end, this is a five prime end, this is a free prime end, this is a five prime end, this is five prime, this is free prime, this is five prime, this is free prime. So what's going to happen is that the five prime strands are going to end up being trimmed. Okay, so let's show that happening. So here, this five prime end has been trimmed here to produce this large free prime overhang that we've got now here. Okay, similarly, on this purple strand, you're also going to get that happening. Now, I don't care anymore about this fragment in the middle, so we're going to ignore that now. Okay, then we've trimmed the five prime ended strand on this side as well to create a large free prime overhang. 
Now, what's going to happen is this free prime overhang here, or indeed this free prime overhang here. I prefer showing it using this one here, but this one could also uh, perform strand invasion. You only need one of them to perform strand invasion, but both of them could potentially do it. I just prefer drawing it for this one here. Okay, right. So this now, this portion here, and I'll highlight it in pink, this portion here, this is complementary to some portion here. Okay, so what's now going to happen is it's going to strand invade this double-stranded piece of DNA that we have put in here. Okay, so let's show this. Uh, so that will have to be our blue strand, hugely zoomed in. Um, and then we're now opening up this double-stranded piece of DNA that we put in there. Okay, like so. So this is just homologous recombination that we're doing here. So here is this blue portion from here. This is our blue portion from here, okay, and here is the purple portion. Now what's going to happen is the next stage of homologous recombination repair. You're going to extend your DNA, okay, using DNA polymerase, okay, and remember that as you extend your DNA, what will be happening is you'll be um, teasing these two strands apart at the front here, and then you'll be putting them back together at the back here. Okay, like so. So, here is the strand opened further up now, like so. So, you're extending this um, free prime overhang here. So, here in blue is the blue portion, and now let's say you've gone into the purple portion now. Okay, like so. And let's just highlight everything else up in blue. So, this is a blue portion. This is a blue portion, and this is that original little five prime ended portion that's been trimmed. Now, we can take this extended free prime overhang here and bind it to the free prime overhang that we've got here, okay? Because this portion, remember, is going to be complementary to this portion because this piece of double stranded DNA here was the same as that portion there, okay? So certainly we've now created a portion that's complementary to this portion, okay? So this is what you're going to do now. Here is the purple strand here, got that purple portion there, and then we've got the blue strand here, like so, and then you'll just use DNA polymerase to fill in this gap here, okay? Producing another portion that's purple, and then you'll use it to fill in this gap here, producing that portion that's blue there. Okay, right. So that is how you can get the cell to repair this mess, uh, where, which you've created with the CRISPR-Cas9 system, using, uh, well, by um, joining this pink portion here to this blue portion here, and therefore you've got rid of the gene A in between them, basically, okay? And that will happen on both homologous chromosomes. So now, we have created embryonic stem cells which have got no copies of gene A within them. Okay, right. So, let's go over to um, um, actually trying to produce a mouse which has got no copies of gene A within it. Okay, so, here we have our cell culture plate which contains the embryonic stem cells, okay? And we now have uh, embryonic stem cells here which have no copies of gene A, okay? However, do you think absolutely every single one of these embryonic stem cells will have gone through this process? The answer is no, it's not got 100% efficiency, even with the CRISPR-Cas9 um, system to actually produce the double-strand break. And by the way, before CRISPR-Cas9, um, well, we did have other ways of producing those double-strand breaks, but a long time ago, you used to have to wait for those double-strand breaks to occur uh, spontaneously, basically, and that was incredibly low efficiency, okay? Um, so that's how the CRISPR-Cas9 system has hugely sped this process up, because we now have ways of selectively putting in those double-strand breaks at those places. We had other ways of doing it before, so for instance, zinc finger nucleases and tailings, but CRISPR-Cas9 is extremely good at doing it. Okay, but its efficiency is still not 100%. So, 
what we firstly need to do is work out which cells on this plate have actually got, um, have lost the two genes and which have not. So what you'll do is uh, you will separate every single cell out, okay? You will then grow it on a culture plate and you will put the cells dotted at different positions. So you might put one cell here, one cell here, one cell here, one cell here. Okay, that you'll then put them in nice conditions so that they can proliferate and they'll all produce little colonies of genetically identical cells. You will then screen each of these colonies to try and find a colony uh, which has no copies of gene A within it. Okay, then once you've found a colony which has no copies of gene A within it, okay, what you're then going to do is grow that colony on. Okay, so that you've got a huge number of these embryonic stem cells with no um, gene A within them. Okay, then what you're going to do is implant these into another blastocyst. So you're going to get another mouse blastocyst. Okay, so here's the trophectoderm here. Okay, and here is the inner cell mass. Now, this is going to be a different mouse to the mouse that we originally got these embryonic stem cells from, okay? So what we're actually going to do is create something known as a chimera, okay? Which is an animal which contains cells from two different individuals. So you're going to take these, um, these mouse embryonic stem cells here and you're going to put them into the inner cell mass so that this inner cell mass now has cells not only of its own, but also from these mouse embryonic stem cells that we've cultured here. Okay, this will now grow up to produce you a mouse. Okay, if you implant it into a female, uh, it will grow into a mouse. Okay, so here we have our mouse. It looks a little bit more like a rabbit, but never mind. Um, now it looks like a mouse. Okay, and this is a chimera. Okay, it contains cells from two different mice, really. Okay, so it's not, all of its cells are not going to be genetically identical. Some of its cells will have derived from these red cells, okay, and some of its cells will have derived from these orange cells here. So some of the cells of this mouse will therefore have no copies of gene A within it, within them rather, because they derived from these orange embryonic stem cells. So let's say this patch of the mouse here, this um, was derived from these uh, embryonic stem cells here, which have no copies of gene A within them. Okay, so these cells will therefore have no copies of gene A within them. However, many cells will have been derived from these red inner cell mass cells, okay, and those will have the copies of gene A still present within them. So this mouse is not a knockout mouse yet, because it still has many cells that do have gene A within it. Okay, what you're now going to do is you're going to um, hope that some of the germ cells within this mouse, okay, and you'll produce many of these chimeric mice, and some of them will have germ cells uh, which were made by these embryonic stem cells which have no copies of gene A within them. Now, what is a germ cell? Well, a germ cell is a cell that's going to be used to make gametes, to make sex cells, to make egg cells if you're a female, and sperm cells if you're a male. Okay, right. Uh, so, what you then need to do is make loads of these chimeric mice, okay, and you need to try and find gametes uh, which have uh, no copies of gene A within them. Okay, and these will be because these gametes were made by germ cells which derived from the embryonic stem cells which had had both copies of gene A within them. And therefore, the gametes cannot possibly have a copy of gene A within them because they've been derived from these cells which didn't have gene A within them. You then need to get two gametes uh, a male gamete, a sperm cell, and a female gamete, an egg cell, uh, which both have no copies of gene A within them. Okay, if you then fuse these two together, you'll get a fertilized egg cell, which has no copies of gene A within it. Okay, this can then be grown up 
into uh, a true knockout mouse that has absolutely no copies of gene A within it. Okay, and that is the basic principle of how you create a genetic knockout. Okay, the technicalities of actually doing this are horrendous. Okay, but that's the basic principle of how it is done.